victory. In the dictionary, victory is said as being defeat of an opponent, success and struggle against difficulties, an obstacle. It implies that there's a war or a battle that's present. And the result, if there's victory, then from war, there should be peace then that follows from that. Well, today in our, our passage, we're coming to, this is the second to the last sermon of this series uh, in the first book of John. And our author of first John is the author of first John, second John, third John, the book of Revelation, and also the gospel of John. And as we've talked about before, he continues to, in this letter, refer back to his gospel to make his points, which is very helpful. Um, but he continues, he's, what he's doing in this letter is he's trying to breathe truth and light into a place of darkness, a place where uh, a community where deception has come in, um, and he's trying to help this community understand what the truth and marks of a genuine Christian are. And he continues to encourage maturity in faith. A question that, um, that I've had over the years uh, for a while, and I've also heard some of the people that are in here, it, and uh, I think is a very wise question, is um, if the Christian gospel has such a strong, powerful message of victory in Christ then why so often can we feel so defeated over and over again? And I think that this message, this um, scripture passage today is going to help us out with that question. This passage has two key points for victory. One is a true faith that... uh, John will uh, help us walk us through, but also he confirms the authenticity of the object of our faith and helping us to strengthen also that faith. So the first, there's only two points today. Um, The first one is uh, true faith, overcoming the world. And our passage is 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. So this first section says, says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Now, this is what Israel has been waiting for. Israel has been waiting for the Messiah to come, the Christ. It's the same thing, the sent one, the anointed one of God. It's also the same person as he's meant to be a descendant. He's supposed to be a descendant of David, King David. David, King David was promised by God that he would always have a descendant on the throne of God's people, of, of Israel. Also, this Messiah is to be the one in line from the, the promise that God made in Genesis 3, right after Adam and Eve sinned. While God was pronouncing the curse on the serpent, he said that... Um, there will be the seed of the woman, seed of the serpent, that, um, that the seed of the woman, though the serpent will strike at his heel, he will crush the head of the serpent. He also, it's interesting that God had announced, the, that was the very first announcement of the gospel right at the beginning, the very beginning in Genesis 3, we hear that. And we also see that Abraham is the one that continues that line, that he is that seed. It's to come through Abraham. It's also to come through the line of David. This is the Messiah to come, and the Messiah was meant to always bring peace into the world. Sin brought death, brought war. This Messiah was meant to bring peace again. And some deceivers back then and even now, we have them a lot now, will say, well, Jesus isn't, he isn't the Christ. He's not, or he's not the son of God. Or maybe he's not fully the son of man. He didn't come in the flesh. And part of what their argument is, is because, especially this comes from um, um, those of, of, the, of the Jewish faith that, that are not believers in who Christ is, they say one of the arguments is that there's no, look around. Does it look like there's peace? 
If there's no peace, he's not the Messiah. There's no way that he can be the Messiah if there's no peace. Because that was the big thing that he ended up uh, being prophesied to bring. So therefore... Now the purpose of John's gospel, he, he talks about that in John 20. John 20, verses 30 through 31, it's the very end of his gospel. And he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He did many miracles I only recorded a handful of them here for one purpose. And that purpose is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name for faith, to strengthen our faith. Born of God, the phrase here used here also, um, we talked about this last week. Um, those that are born of God, they know God. And in John, uh, in his gospel, in, in chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, again, he says that the true light, which gives light to everyone, this is how he starts his gospel off, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but the will of God. And what that's talking about, Ezekiel 37, I think highlights what this is basically getting at really well. And that's the, the passage on the Valley of Dry Bones. We've talked about that before. But what happens in this passage is that uh, God brings Ezekiel in a vision out to this valley of, of dry bones, of dead bones. And he says, this is all of my people. This is all of Israel. They're dead, basically. A bunch of bones that are there. And he asks the prophet, he says, can they live? And the prophet says, oh God, only you know. And God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones Tell them for flesh to come upon them. And flesh came upon them. There was a big noise. And he says, but they were still dead. There was no life in them. So then God says, prophet, speak to these dead bodies, basically, and, and speak life into them. Tell the spirit to come in. Some, some uh, uh, versions say breath. Um, breath and spirit are the same word in Hebrew and actually in Greek as well, which are the two languages that the, the Bible's written in. Um, he says, speak to the spirit or speak to the breath and tell the breath to come into them and they will live. And this is what he says that I will do. I will bring my spirit into my people in the future and they will live. I will give you my spirit and you will live. Isn't it interesting that that's the last thing he does before also Adam and Eve have life, that he breathes his spirit into them? You also see what the, this same thing is happening in John 3, verses 3 through 8, where Jesus uh, is talking to Nicodemus, and we talked about this last week as well, and he says, truly, truly, I tell you that only, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, and, and Nicodemus can't get this. He's like, how does a grown person go back into the womb? That's just, it's not possible. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, unless one is born of water, water is a baptism of repentance is to ask for forgiveness. Now, in order to repent, that's not, I'm sorry, and then keep doing what you've been doing. That's not repentance. Repentance is, yeah, apologizing, but also asking for forgiveness and then turning and walking differently. True repentance is seen by how what you do after you ask for the repentance. If you continue doing what you were doing before, you're not sorry. That's clear. What you say is one thing, but you're doing something totally different. So repentance is turning and walking somewhere a different way. But he says, unless they are born of water, which that signifies death to the flesh, basically sub uh, submitting to God, and the spirit, which is the provision of God, then he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh belongs to the flesh, is flesh, and that of the spirit belongs to the spirit. We need the Spirit of God in order to come into that new life. That is important. Repentance and then the giving of the Holy Spirit. 
Born of God are those who follow the Christ, die to self, and live for God's will. We've talked about that many times before. It's a matter of stepping off of the throne and giving God his rightful place in our lives. He rules, not us anymore. It's very different from natural birth. And this, is, this one's initiated by God through his spirit and takes place in conjunction with faith in Christ, repentance and following. It's a complete submission of heart to God. God's spirit then gives us the love that he has for his children, especially those that believe in him. Our love for other believers marks the authentic Christian in truth. So continuing, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now this is reverse of what he's been arguing before, right? He's been arguing actually almost exactly the reverse of this, that we love, if we love his, his people, then we will be able to keep his commandments. But John does argue in a circle many times. That's his way of arguing. And basically what he's saying here, he's, he's saying the only reason, um, or I'm sorry, that we cannot obey God's word without loving his children, and we cannot love his children without the obedience to his word. See, here's, here's I mean, it is kind of, it's a miracle that's going on here when we come to Christ. It really is. But it is an, a matter of submission, though, absolutely. When a person says, I'm trying to obey God, I want to, I'm trying to be good, I just can't, it's so hard. The problem is, is that we're trying without the Spirit. We live in a country that has to control everything. We control everything. I mean, it, that's just illuminated by how quickly we're inconvenienced, right? If we have to wait for anything, it's, it, we all get all bent out of shape, right? Does everybody realize that I'm here? I mean, seriously. I should be able to cut in front of everybody else because I am important. I have things to do. Clearly, everybody has not realized that. Right? When we submit to God and we, and we really submit to him and allow him to have his way, it's not about us anymore. It's the spirit of God comes into us and really we naturally get transformed into his likeness. He, a lot of times, will bring it to the forefront, something that we need to work on. And then we, we realize, okay, and we, and we walk and we, we realize that unless he intervenes, we're not going to be able to do it. We can't overcome it. And once we then ask for the help of it, it just happens. It, like, goes away. And you look back and go, it was there, like, a week or two ago, and now I just don't seem to be having an issue with it anymore. That's the magic of it. What he's talking about, his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments, see what, what Christ talks about or what God talks about in his word in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, this is a very important part of scripture. He says, in that time, I will write my law on their heart. It won't be like the old uh, covenant when I brought them out of Egypt and then they sinned against me even though I asked them I told them in my commandments what they should do and they rebelled against me this new covenant is going to be totally different all of my people will have my law will be written on their heart what he's talking about is the in working of the spirit that transforms us when we really are submitting to it he transforms us starts to move us into more of his likeness, more and more and more. But we got to let go of the flesh, of the me. I'm important. We are important as God's children, but he knows that. And we need to have peace knowing that he knows that. We serve him. So continuing, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except for the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We just established that born of God are those that have died to self and live for God and will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, in 1 John, a little bit earlier in this letter, 
in uh, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, he says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the, sin, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, these are all the things we were just talking about, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Surrender. Overcoming the world is conquering the rebellion against God inside of us. When that's gone, then we have peace. In John 16, Jesus is about to go to the cross and he's, he's speaking to his disciples. And he says, I've said these things. He gives them a bunch of prophecy that these things are going to happen. And he says to them, he says, I have said these things to you that in me, in me, you may have peace, which is what the Messiah was to do to establish peace. In me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. Some say tribulation, which is more intense. So in me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. The one that we live in is the conquering one. The one that has conquered the world. 2 Peter 2.19 says, whatever overcomes a person. We talked about this last week. It's so powerful, though, that i got to come back to it. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. What overcomes us? Is it anger, pride, greed, selfishness? Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? Is it sex? Whatever it is, what are the things that overcome us? That is what we are enslaved to. If it's God, then he overcomes it all. If he's the one that rules, if he is the one that prevails, 1 John 4.4, 4, he says that who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I'll give you a, a visual of what I'm getting at. Sin is like gravity. It's always there, and it's always pulling us down. Always. The Spirit of God is like a hot air balloon. It has the power to overcome the gravity as long as we're in it in the basket. If we're in it, then we can overcome the sin. If we're not, apart from that, we can't. We fall apart from the balloon. The power of sin is very strong, but the power of God is much greater. And we must use it. We must live in it. The reason for maturity is something that... Uh, I was meant to put it in last week's message, but I had to cut it uh, off um, for time. But so I want to include it here because it's, again, very important. Second Peter 1, 3 through 11. Peter is talking about in this letter the importance of maturity as a Christian. And this is so, if you want a, a passage to meditate on through the week, this is the one. It's very powerful. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 3 through 11. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. He's given us all we need, everything he has given to us. He has brought us into his presence and through his very great promises, through his word, we have access so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature. Through them we may come back into the likeness of God that we were always intended for all the way from Genesis 1, Genesis 2. When he created us, he created us in his image and likeness, meant to reflect him and to co-rule with him, to reflect him. We're not God, but we were to reflect who God is. We're made in his image and likeness. But that all got corrupted. What Peter is saying here is that God's given us everything we need to come back into that, to return to what we were meant to be. 
having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brother effect, brotherly affection and love. Remember over the last couple of weeks we've been talking about love one another. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, are maturing, then they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks in these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from former sins. Basically he's saying that this is the same person is so blind that they take the shackles that have been released and put them back on themselves. Why would you do that? Why do we do that? Is what he's basically arguing here. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two things I want to highlight. Why? To keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To keep you from being defeated is the first thing. Christian maturity is to keep you from being defeated, number one. And number two, there will be richly provided for us an entrance into the kingdom of Christ. Now, listen close to this. This is from Luke 17, 20, verse 21. This is what Jesus says. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, there it is, or here it is. But the kingdom of God is in you. What he's saying here is this. In this world, it is corrupt. When we ask, why do certain things happen? It's because this is not the way things were meant to be. This is not the way things were meant to be. I think it's very clear to see that with all the evil that is around. Is there love here? Yeah, of course there is, but there's a lot of evil here as well. It's not the way it meant things were meant to be. And we shouldn't look at that and, and try and judge who God is by that because his word tells us something very different. What Christ is saying is the world here, yeah, it, it will be corrupt. This world, it, it's not going to get any better. In fact, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And eventually, it'll be annihilated, and then God recreates a world that has no evil in it anymore. Christ is saying here, the peace isn't coming out here. The peace is coming internally. This is where the kingdom of God is, internally. As an individual, but as many individuals come together and embrace the kingdom of God, the peace that Christ brings from within, we can have that as a community as well. That's what it was always meant to be. For those who have been born of God have overcome the worldly tendency to satisfy their own sinful cravings. As a result, they are free to show love to others and so fulfill God's command. It's the new life in the individual and the community as a whole. So, the victory that has overcome the world is our faith. And God's definition of faith is Abrahamic faith. It's the faith that isn't tricked by the eyes, but leans on the promises of God, knows his word, and no matter what he sees or she sees, knows that God's word is true, that he is good, and that he follows it. He walks in it, and he gives the very best to God. Even his firstborn son, he was willing to give. Why? Because he knows God is good. He knows God is good. It says in the book of Hebrews that he knew that he would bring him back to life even if needed to follow God. The Messiah is the son of God that came in the flesh, so he's also the son of man and his fullness is revealed here. And that's what he gets into next. So before we get into that, do we have victory in Christ? Do we? What is our faith in? Is it the world or is it Jesus? 
And if we have victory in Christ, our lives will have peace, even if chaos is surrounding us. It overcomes the oppression. This is Christian maturity, the place that we should all be moving towards. We can get weak in it if we don't practice these things. They need to be practiced regular. They need to be worked as a community also and encouraged, helped as a community. That's what the whole New Testament, other than the gospel, that's the whole New Testament. Paul, Peter, John, all of the writers, are. that's the, what they're doing. They're saying, let's, we need to mature in Christ. That's the whole point. After the gospel was given, then let's get the maturity going to become mature Christians. Not being fed by milk, but by solid food. Jesus even says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Don't have anxiety, let my peace dwell within you. If we have the power of God dwelling within us, we don't, have, we don't need to worry about anything. Why would we? He who is greater than all things of this world is in us and with us, just like what he says here. I am with you. All right, the object of our faith, the second part. Validation of who Jesus is. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. This highlights the dispute, part of the dispute, but he's battling here specifically. Not that, they came, that he came by water, but that he also came by blood. Coming by water marked the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry. Remember John the Baptist, he baptized him, the Spirit of God came upon him, and God even said, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. At the end of his life, his blood was the mark on the cross. When he says, it is finished. The Spirit of God was with him, proving when he was resurrected that God, he is from God. I don't know anybody else that was resurrected before Jesus. John the Baptist, uh, Baptist baptizes Jesus. In John 1, 29 through 34, he says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one whom I said that I did not know him. Now, first of all, when he says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, how does he do it? Through his blood at the cross. So he's attesting to it right there. But also, he said, I myself didn't know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend on hev from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, He who is to come, or him who, he whom you see, the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I borne witness that he is the Son of God. Jesus' baptism by water is one of repentance, like we talked about. It's not needed for him, but by him getting baptized, he identifies with humanity. I am fully human, is what he's saying at this place here. I can intercede for these people because I am fully human, even without sin. And he is the one also that will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He brings with him a new baptism. The blood of Christ is the atonement for all of humanity, only sufficient because he's also the Son of God. If he wasn't the Son of God, his blood wouldn't do anything. Remember, Moses was willing to sacrifice himself even for his people, but God said, you don't have the capital to pay the price. Jesus does have the capital to pay the price. The atoning significance of Jesus' work is that deceivers would not, that that's what they would not agree to. Their claim was that Jesus merely had a baptizing ministry. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there is three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. In John 14, 15, and 16, um, each of them talk about how the Spirit of truth 
um, is there. And the spirit of truth will testify to who Jesus is. This is the spirit's role, to testify to who Jesus is. And same thing for Jesus' people. They are filled with the spirit to also testify to who Jesus is. Two to three witnesses were required by the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, and 19, verse 15. The spirit confirms that Jesus is the Messiah through the baptism, like I said, as far as that the spirit fell upon him but also through the blood at the cross by his resurrection. The spirit, the water, the blood all attest that this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah that was prophesied to come. So if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son, this is an argument from lesser to greater like we saw last week. If we accept men's testimony, men and women, then God's testimony is much greater than ours. It's very simple. Jesus in John 5, 31 through 37, he says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. He's talking about what we just said in Deuteronomy 17. It's part of the law. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John and he is borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than John. Why? Because he's God. But for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me and the Father who sent me himself bore witness about me. How? Through the Spirit, like we were just talking. So, both human testimony and God's testimony is clearly seen through the Gospels. And he says, this is my Son, who I am well pleased. Listen to him. So, in result, we have a choice. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made God a liar. Why? Because he says, this is the one. And if we say, no, it's not, what we're basically saying is that God's word is not true. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't accept it. When we select, even when we select parts of the Bible, I like this part of Jesus, but I don't like this part over here. So I'm not going to accept that. But I'll accept these over here. These are nice and friendly and furry. These over here aren't bad. That's not acceptable. It's either all of God's testimony or none. It's one, if we want to pick and choose, then what he's basically saying is that we're saying that God is a liar. He's a liar. Now, it doesn't hurt for us to say, I don't understand. I'm human, and clearly I don't understand this text, God. We pray to him and ask, help me to understand this text. That's still having a mind of submission. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that we say, well, clearly, because, <laughs> again, that's the arrogance that comes through. Clearly, if I don't understand it, nobody can understand it, so therefore, it must be wrong. No. Pray for God to work in us and reveal it to us. It's right. We're just not understanding it yet, how it works. He'll give it to us if we ask him, the understanding. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. John says this at the very beginning of this letter. I've seen the life, the eternal life made manifest, and I'm proclaiming it to you so that you might have life, that you might have fellowship as I have fellowship and the other disciples have fellowship with the eternal life through the Son. Life starts now and goes into eternity. It's not once we die, then we get this eternal life. The life we get now, that's the peace that Christ talks about. The peace that the Messiah brings us is now and it goes into eternity. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And Jesus talks about this in the vine. John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me you can do nothing. 
He even goes on to even say this. He says, um, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. If you keep my commandments, I will, you will abide in my love, just as I have abided in the Father's love by obeying his commandments. You do these things and my joy will be in you and your joy will be full. It's another way. His joy is moving us to a place of peace again. So when we have very validation of something, testimonies of good work, we're, gonna be, we're, we're looking into um, getting the, the parking lot redone and we've asked for certificates of authentication, right? Or of a testimony. Is this a good company to go with, right? So that if we get these letters that are val validate the work, that this is a good company or a good individual to work with, then we can have peace, knowing that they do good work and have faith in their work. Well, here God is writing the letter of recommendation. I sign off on this guy. Yeah, this is the Messiah. This is my son. He's the real deal. He's worthy of the call to surrender to him, to follow him, and he will give us the life eternal, the spirit which he has and gives it unconditionally. It's the proof and the power and the victory. It is the peace that dwells within us. So when things don't go well, what do we doubt? Do we doubt the reliability of God's word, his testimony, or the reliability of this world? Do we live in the peace of Christ, confident in his power and promises, or do we try to live in the world and in Christ? and then impatiently wonder why we are so void of peace. Who needs to adjust, us or God? Where do we seek our life truly? This text reinforces the vital importance of accepting the whole revelation of who Jesus is and what he calls us into. And if we fully embrace him in truth, complete surrender, then our faith will have the power to overcome the power of the world because it will be amply supplied by the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven will dwell within and we will have peace even when our world seems like it's falling around us. So the proposal today is in order to receive the full blessings of the Christ, victory, then we must accept the full testimony of God. That is something of surrender, submission, following. Then we will get the Spirit and he will give us peace but we need to walk in the Spirit if we are going to live by the Spirit. Amen.